So just for me to give a brief introduction of Stefan. Uh, well, I, actually, I, I didn't even prepare something written because I know Stefan quite well. Uh, when I was a PhD student at Hopkins, Stefan was a postdoc. So he was the man that we were looking to, to be, right? And, and, uh, and he would always come by and ask like questions about uh, like cold firm steel and stability and we would chat. And actually, I don't know if you remember Stefan, but uh, uh, your wife was pregnant of your first daughter. Yes, right? yes, oh, definitely. So much time has passed that actually like a, a couple of months ago, I watched his, uh, his daughter he, like uh, presenting a violin concert. So that's uh, how much has that. Yes, she's 11 now, yes. Yeah. And she went for a sleepover to her uh, friend, yes. And, uh, and Stefan was, like he had finished his PhD in Florida, he's from Poland. And, and then he had finished his PhD and he worked in the industry for some time with nuclear power plants design. And, and then uh, he came to Hopkins with the dream of being academic. So he did his postdoc there. And after that, he went to Surrey University in England, close to London. And uh, two years ago, if I'm not wrong, he moved to Durham University, right? So now yes. he's at Durham University, it's a little colder. Uh, in, uh, I remember very well that uh, I met Stefan in a conference and then we met in Baltimore again. And we were chatting about what to do, like research together. And, and then, then I was very excited because he was working on steel foam. And I was like, yeah, Stefan, uh, let's try to do something in that area. Uh, and I remember talking to my PhD advisor, and I was like, so I think Stefan and I are going to work together. And then Ben Schaefer turned to me, he was like, if you can harness his mind and his creativity, you guys are going to publish so much. That was like exactly what he said. And uh, oh, that I is so good. Nowadays because Stefan is, uh, is a bunch of ideas, like every 10 minutes, there is a new idea. And, and it's amazing to work with someone that has so creative. And he's so creative that uh, last year, it was actually a project that he had been developing for a while. He became quite famous because he invented the non-cuttable material, uh, which is going to present to us about it today, right? Yes. Uh, so I think I did, uh, did I forget something, Stefan? No, 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 Luis, thank you for a very kind introduction. Yes, and you I already feel the- kids, a wife and- uh, it's someone that we, uh, uh, in the field, we really regard as someone that is working very seriously and, and is always working more and more and more. Yeah. It's, uh, we are very glad to have you in the field. Oh, thank you, Luis. That is very generous of you. Honestly, I feel uh, a bit overwhelmed because I think we all do our best. <laughs> To make yes contributions and uh, and yes and I guess creativity I feel that it's the first step right the important thing is the planning the implementation and I remember when I visited you I was really impressed with the work plan that you had this big printout for all the students who the milestones who's doing what I thought wow this is a well oil oil machine uh, I took me some time to learn the two. So I think there is yes, a need for balance between creativity, organization. Yes, it all fits together as a community. And yes, I think. Um, but yes, that is very kind introduction. I'm, I really don't know what to say. <laughs> it's uh, no, it's um, a great pleasure to have you with us and, <coughs> um, and like doing research with us here in any country. Right? Um, so I don't think we need more introductions. Um, please, Stefan, the floor is all yours. Uh, if, you, if you know how to use Zoom super well, right? Yes, yes, yes. I will share my screen with you. Yeah. Uh, how much time do I have just to be sure that I don't overrun? It's uh, uh, 40 minutes, right, Jose? Okay. 40 minutes, right? 
Um, Luis, I think you may uh, need to uh, enable screen sharing because when I try to share, it says host okay. disabled. Right. Uh, Sorry, you can try it again. No problem. Yes. It's and, uh, well, if you uh, if the people in the audience has any question, I would um, I would advise you to put in the chat. I will be the one taking all the questions at the end. Uh, and I think that we can do in more organized fashion. Um, but please feel free to just put in the chat and, and I will take notes here. And thank you very much for or everyone for coming. Thank you. Yes, thank you again. And uh, <coughs> I, I will talk today about non cuttable material. Yes, we called it non cuttable as opposed to uncuttable because we don't claim it's impossible. I don't know. Nothing is impossible, I guess. But uh, it seems to be extremely difficult to cut, and we haven't been able to cut it with conventional tools. Um, this is a photo of the university uh, location. I usually go i think this this is the place i place i go for lunch as you can see the weather is much colder than in brazil uh, most of I'm the sorry. year oh it's in the corner yeah yes mm -hmm. um no problem uh so it is much colder but i think we have uh, also students from brazil um, i think it's a good place to study <clears throat> so basically this is the motivation for the talk and uh, I hope to in maybe touch on this idea of hierarchical structures and analogies with nature, because I think this is actually like generally interesting. And nature has evolved over millions of years to produce interesting architectures. Um, I think a few days ago, I saw this idea of like folding wind turbine blades which is inspired by the palm trees that palm trees and like under heavy storm they can kind of fault um, so there are many ideas there and it seems yes that those structures are usually resource efficient and personally i feel that there is also the scope for pre-programmed responses because even plants they follow the sun like the leaves there is some movement they are not static they are not like stone and this doesn't and this happens sometimes without the use of the brain as just some kind of embedded features and i think maybe we can replicate those with uh, using the human made systems so the goal is yes to produce novel mechanisms to withstand prescribed loads so things that work as systems and advance mathematical descriptions of those systems and i guess yes the benefits are if we can reduce the material use, it's good. Uh, I personally feel it's also interesting. <clears throat> and so this is like a high level introduction that if we compare bulk materials, the so-called architected or architectured materials, it's like comparing Egyptian pyramids, which are kind of solid to the Eiffel Tower, which is more like elegant. It has some kind of structure. Um, and yes, yeah, so most of the biological structures have quite intricate arrangement and layout and self-assembly. And I guess most of the bulk materials are a bit like pyramids, right? So we can do something to connect the two and we have more and more tools to do that. Um, so yes, one approach, this is from the paper that yes, I have not nothing, nothing to do with it, it's just, kind of a background image that we can now even free print in this nanoscale. So this is a couple of years ago, tubes and assembled from tubes, lattices and lattices of lattices. Maybe it's still expensive and, and not easy to do, but it is becoming increasingly possible to create such hierarchical structures. Uh, this is a snippet from a work that I was involved in with my colleagues from Johns Hopkins University, actually, from Josephine Karstensten. She's now at MIT. Um, and I remember, I must say, I admire her because sometimes people set their own destiny. And I think after she graduated, she was offered a very huge startup package in Texas. That was really massive, you know, hundreds of thousands 
of dollars, but she turned it down. She said, no, my husband is in Boston. I want to set roots there. And she went through a slow route of being like a teaching assistant lecturer. And now she has a full-time position at MIT. So she knew what she wanted, but yeah. So here it was basically a topology optimization performed by Reza, Ali, and um, I was involved in finite element modeling of this. But yes, I guess once we have the manufacturing methods, the question is how do we design those topologies, right? What do we print? There are so many possibilities, I find it overwhelming. Um, and yes, here we have a restriction of like a unit cell. So it has to be copy paste, but nature maybe doesn't have this restriction, but I find it quite incredible that we have all this freedom for different objective functions. Um, so the area that I was interested in early on, and that was the project Louis was talking about. And I think this is actually from, um, from the original paper when I was working at Hopkins is looking at metallic foams. So basically, can we have cellular structures <coughs> that are made of metals? And can we try to replicate the complexity maybe is a big word of nature, but using synthetic materials like metals, ceramics, maybe fibers, some advanced technologies <coughs> to produce something more complicated. And one of the building blocks would be say, cellular metals as a matrix, as, as a platform, as opposed to 3D printed, because this might be cheaper, maybe it's, we can upscale it more. The main issue, I think, with most of the porous materials, which is not really talked about, is, is they are relatively weak in tension. So when you look at the papers on 3D printed lattices, there are very rarely tensile results reported. Um, it's usually compressive data because they are brittle in tension. Um, but yes, we were looking at ways of modeling it. So this is from our paper with Luis. Um, that when we look at the thermal properties, so what happens at higher temperatures once the properties of the base material change, so those shells heat up and maybe it affects the young modulus or the yield stress, how is it going to translate in the macroscopic properties? What is the link between the mic micro scale and the macro scale? So what we found there is that the heat will mostly affect the yield stress and the yield stress will affect the plastic buckling capacity because this spheres buckle plastically. So the buckling is not controlled by elastic young modulus, but by the yield stress sort of it's in the material controlled regime. Uh, <clears throat> it will kind of linearly translate in the loss of properties. So the yield stress will control. But yes, looking at those theoretical analysis, it became apparent that if the shells are very thin and this was controlled by elastic buckling, maybe we, have, we could have reversible mechanism and the young modulus would control the response. And I think we managed to find the paper on ultra thin lattices, tubular ones, but they have very similar buckling description, which actually are hyperelastic, were reported to be hyperelastic. And, so that was a good observation there. But I guess this is the platform material, flexible, crushable, <clears throat> and that is useful. And usually the stress strain curve looks like this. So there is some elastic portion and then it's this plateau when the spheres or pores begin to buckle, crash, come in contact. And this propagates from small points to more and more and eventually once everything collapses, it starts to densify. Uh, so what does it have to do with nature, right? Um, so if you look at, say, a grapefruit skin, you would see that effectively this is from paper by Professor Burik Polacek in Germany, who was, who was interested in biomaterials. The left images, images on the left are from the papers of Professor Meyers, who is in California. And uh, he has looked into many different things. Like, I think he had a paper one or two years ago when he was surveying uh, feathers of different birds. So he looked at feathers of condors, but also at colibri. So all kinds of feathers. 
and he found that there is a common length scale when you, when you look at the fibers of those feathers that they have like a common feature at some point, <clears throat> which he said maybe this is a, something important about turbulence or how things work. <clears throat> so yes, his group look at different biological structures and this paper is like 13 years ago uh, when they looked at the shells. And the main feature that they reported was that there is this interlay or contrast between stiff tiles and soft matrix. And yes, maybe the key benefit of that is that it forces crack deflection. So when the crack goes in the hard material and it hits the soft medium, it kind of gets stuck, maybe needs to look for a different route. And this made me think, yes, of this technique that is oftentimes, sometimes used say, in steel bridges, right? If there is a crack and we want to stop it, we can just drill a hole at the tip of the crack and suddenly we release the stress intensity from the point to like a larger region and the crack stops there, it needs to, you know, find a different route somewhere else. So this seems to be a quite effective mechanism, this crack deflection, but it's based on the stiff and soft. <clears throat> So it seems that nature likes such contrasts for fracture toughness. And also when you look at this peel, it seems to be made of kind of like multiple levels of hierarchy. So it's a porous material, a little bit like our steel foam, but it is made of strats. So it's like a uh, truss or frame made of thin tubes. Each tube is kind of small, but it's a hollow circular tube. And if you zoom in and you look at the walls of the tube, it's basically a fibrous composite. So you could think of it, you know, as a short fiber composite, <clears throat> which is assembled into tubes, tubes into spatial kind of truss lattice, and this lattice forms a larger scale. So something that we all have seen, it has a quite intricate engineering structure, if you think of that, yes. But no way we take it for granted. Nobody really pays attention to this. And when I spoke to my French colleague, he said they like to eat all kinds of, you know, sea creatures. So, uh, you know, mussels and shells and nobody, and this goes to the bean. Nobody wonders about those micro scale things. And actually these short fibers are also quite interesting here because I know that there are groups that Bristol that they looked at the fracture resistant yarns and I think they came up with this idea of like short yarns that this arrests the cracks <coughs> and so on. So basically the inspiration was that the soft material is good, it absorbs the, um, the shock, it's light, this is very light, but combining it with hard material creating this contrast could be good to stop the cutting tools, but of course not via the fracture toughness because it's a different loading, but basically by harnessing the natural vibrations or the vibrational nature of this interaction. So the background to the project is quite <laughs> accidental, I would say, that um, I uh, was introduced to someone from the home office, which is like the security agency in the UK. And uh, I said, I am interested in cellular materials, metallic foams and, you know, okay, no, nobody was really interested in that much. And then they said, okay, these are our problems. We have a problem with those battery powered angle grinders, because basically this is a video. If you try to cut like an armor steel or anything, you know, that seems to be hard, it doesn't take long to cut it. Uh, so yes, they said, this might be a problem for us that people could get into banks or security, secure facilities. This is a quite powerful thing. <clears throat> and we don't know how to stop this. The only solution is to make it super thick. So it takes a long time, but then it becomes impractical. Like the doors are so heavy that you can't open the doors. You need a motor, like all kinds of problems happen. And, and they are not expensive, I guess. I mean, this was a few years ago, but like say, you know, $30 or 40, this is not like something that is super uh, pricey. <clears throat> and I guess, yes, after this publicity in media, I was contacted by different companies say, this is like an example of a bicycle shed in London. And yes, people steal bicycles. There are like 10 bicycles inside 
you cut one lock and you can get 10 bicycles out. Uh, so I said, yes, we could help you with that. But of course they want something, you know, for $20, right? They, everybody wants quality, but not, not to pay for it anything substantial. And of course at the smallest prototyping scale or early state, nothing is really that cheap. <clears throat> but it seems that this is a real problem. Yes, even for like commercial activities. <clears throat> so this is basically the production and uh, this was done in cooperation with Fraunhofer Institute in Germany. I have been working with them for many years um, and they developed this uh, powder metallurgy approach. So the way this is made is basically powders are mixed. It's a bit like baking. Uh, metallic powders, aluminum chips with some kind of foaming agents. Then this needs to be really pre-compressed. So this goes under high pressure um, and this high pressure extrudes bars. They look like solid metal bars. You know, this is compressed powder, but it already looks, the pressure is so high that it looks like a steel bar or aluminum bar. And then we like kind of interlay this with ceramics to create this contrast, like in the seashells, that there is stiff, soft, stiff, soft contrast there. And this is what it looks after foaming <clears throat> when you look at the CT scan that we have those hard inclusions in the cellular material. I guess the cellular material looks a little bit like bone, like metallic bone. Um, and yes, the, the, the concept was that, okay, so this is, this is the recording of when we try to cut it, but the, the initial concept was that we wanted to cre create vibrational interface. So when you try to cut it, the disc vibrations will kind of interact with the sphere and this will be disruptive to the disc. So that was the idea. That is the recording of a test from the home office. And uh, So you can see that disc was gone <clears throat> and uh, that was a typical behavior. So how does it work? So this is the video from Galileo that basically gives like a high level idea that yes, when the disc tries to cut, the spheres sort of go in resonance, vibrate. And this vibrational interface is kind of, yes, very inconvenient for the discs. It's basically like a moving target. Um, and I guess it is a little bit like with uh, sandbags in the war zones, right? That we all know that sand, sand is very soft. You can build sand castles, you, you know, it's not a huge protective structure, but soldiers feel quite safe, you know, from uh, fast flying bullets hiding behind sandbags because basically they believe in, you know, they subconsciously, you know, believe that bullets will get stuck because of the strain rate effect, right? That the sand really stiffens up when you load it quickly. And it's something maybe to do with like contact repulsion or some physical. So we could say that there is like a physical hardness, right? We don't have, we don't have diamond or some hard ceramic. We just create a fast moving interface, which basically what it does is it amplifies the disc vibration. So when you look at the vibrations of rotating disc, they have different modes. The caveat is that, you know, these modes are in the frame of reference, maybe that is rotating with the disc. So if you stand on the disc and you rotate, you would see this, right? But if you are an observer, you would basically see waves traveling around the disc. So it seems that all those modes, especially those, <clears throat> those modes that are in that form waves along the circumference, those waves actually keep moving like it consists of two waves 
moving in opposite directions. So they form a standing wave, but there is a lot of kind of movement when you rotate things. Um, <clears throat> and there are different modes. So what happens is when this waves hit a point load, it's basically like a wave breaker, right? Imagine that you, are, you have those waves racing around and suddenly they hit a hard object that is on the way, it really disrupts those waves. Like they start, you know, reflecting and so all kinds of vibrations begin. And this interface is very unsettled between this disc and the ceramic sphere. So this is, you know, high speed, uh, very jiggery kind of interface, mainly because of the nature of the disc. That, and this has been actually discovered by, was super interesting to find the original work on vibration of discs. That was um, done by an engineer who worked for General Electric. So these issues were identified in, in steam turbines in like 100 years ago. That the steam turbines seem to have different frequencies when they were shattering because yes, those waves that travel around, they kind of have lower and higher frequency. And when you add them up, they get the frequency that you calculate. So if you are in the resonance, they can sh shatter the steam turbine. So those theoretical solutions were, yes, developed 100 years ago. But there is a lot of sort of movement and waves. Once they hit the spheres, this uh, interface is vibrating. The other <laughs> unintended benefit <clears throat> that was a bit accidental was that Initially, we were asked to make it as cheap as possible. So we went for low quality ceramics because they are cheap. If you, the higher the purity, the higher the cost. Um, and uh, so actually the home office bought us the ceramics and they bought the cheapest they could find. And the advantage was that actually they, the way the ceramics are made, it turns out that it's basically grains that are baked together. And if you don't apply good pressure or high temperature, you still retain this grain structure there. So once those grains begin to sort of spread around, it's, they become a bit like a sandpaper. So a bit like the sandbag for the bullet, that you have all those particles now at the high uh, speed, you know, vibrational interface. So they become, they basically overpower the disc. <clears throat> and that's why the disc begins to disappear because this is this dynamic grinding that is destroying it. Um, so yes, yeah, so there is a little bit of initial cut. Once this initial cut happens, there is better contact between this disc and the sphere. Now it's like properly disrupting it, it's clamped and we have all those particles around it. And now this reaches this kind of, you know, state when the disc begins to be destroyed. So it's kind of like an evolutionary thing that you need to grab it, grip it, uh, amplify the vibrations by doing that, have powder, so it starts grinding it, and then it's, it works well. Um, so I guess it, it was quite interesting to think of that, that by developing like a physical mechanism that is kind of, you know, dynamic and maybe some transformations need to happen, we can defeat the disks without using diamond or something super hard. And there are many physical phenomena like that. I mean, you know, the sandbag is one example, but you know, there are covalent bonds that open and close face transformations. I think nature uses all kinds of tricks to achieve the functions, not necessarily, yes, using some, doing something simple. So that was very, yes, very encouraging. And then we look at those powders and yes, what are they made of and <clears throat> what do they look like? So this is the fiberglass from the disc. And this image shows the grain structure of this chip ceramics that if you light some kind of light, you will see that these are surfaces and they reflect light, you know, they are not, it's not like a mono material. <clears throat> it's, you have grains because it's low quality, which happened to be good for us, I guess. But I I, I'm honest about this, that was accidental discovery. That was a bit lucky benefit, which 
sometimes I guess we need a little bit of luck. Um, another, I would say also lucky uh, discovery was that when we tried to use water jet cutter to cut some samples, it turned out that there is also an issue for water jet cutter because it turns out that hard obstacles, they widen the jet. So there was a paper published in Japan which said if you spray, if you direct a jet on a surface with positive curvature, it will immediately widen the jet. And that's what happens, that it goes, gets to the sphere. It also gets like a partial cut. But once this partial cut is made, it starts widening the jet. And once the jet widens, it's not cutting anymore. It's like there is not enough abrasion um so basically it, it gets stuck it like reaches the point when it comes here it just widens and there's nothing more to abrace here because it's done and once it comes in contact and has this curvature to widen it just widens and so yes again it seems that those contrasts are inconvenient for some things um so then, yes, it made me think that why not test other properties, right? If this is such a peculiar, not peculiar, but, you know, this contrast between spheres and, for, and cellular structure has some effects on the water jet cutting. We see it in nature for fracture toughness. <coughs> so what happens if we try to shoot at it with bullets? And this is like an, an image of what happens when you shoot with a bullet into a steel plate. And this is X-ray images. It's very hard to catch the fast flying bullet. So uh, these are three images that are overlaid because that's how it works. Like it shoots three images and then you get this one overlaid picture on one uh, sheet of X-ray you know, membrane. So you can see the bullet going in, it shatters, but then it, the fragments still fly through the steel plate. I guess uh, in our case, what I believe is happening is something similar that was observed for these uh, plates with uh, slots, that when the bull fast flying bullets, they don't like to be sort of hit on the side. So this creates some internal w refractions or reflections or some waves that shatter the bullet. So actually, if you have two plates and you shoot at the slotted one, it will stop the bullet. If you shoot at the solid one, the bullet will go through. That's the paradox. The only uh, caveat is that the slot has to be cut to the specific bullet. So, you know, and you need to, uh, and the bullet needs to hit the, the hole. So you need a bit of luck and it's not practical because you don't know what your bullet looks like, right? So that is only works in the lab. But yes, it has been observed in the past that if you hit bullets, not in the tip, but on the side, it is, can be destructive to them. And I believe that this is kind of similar to what was happening with our samples, that the bullet flies, but it doesn't hit the sphere perfectly. It would be pure luck to hit it, you know, perfectly in the center. So most of the time this contact is oblique or at an angle and it shatters the bullet. So we just need a stiff back plate. So this is the back plate to catch the fragment. So the bullet will shatter, but this, there is still energy. It's, it is still flying very fast. If we have something else to catch it on the back face, we can stop it. Um, and this is the, you know, and I mean, the amazing thing was that the bullet really shattered into very small particles because we just couldn't find any big chunks of it when we looked into it, kind of, it's just this black, you know, smoke. Uh, but yet no physical like fragments. If you look at this, you can see like big fragments, you know. But yeah, we couldn't find any fragments. That was puzzling. Uh, but yes, it seems that this could lighten, create slightly lighter solutions. Uh, so this is like the different classes, but it's not that important, I guess. And I really like this video. This is like a blast test uh, recording from France and I always ask this question like how many waves do you see like if you look do you see the like the air compressing and those kind of uh, concentric uh, contours do you see this via zoom or not yes and I guess what do you think why there are so many of them 
because it's not just one, right? So what do you think? There are more than one explosion, it's like, or? So basically the answer is yeah, reflections. So yes, it's, uh, it reflects of this hard surfaces and once it bounces back, it follows. So those reflections actually, we can see the reflections there. So the first wave is the original one, but the, the other ones are just the ones that rebounded from this hard surfaces, yes. So it's a bit like waves on the water. They can, you know, reflect of the boundaries. That is, you know, quite interesting, I think. <clears throat> and now you can see, yes, the, the blast wind. So first is the shock wave and then it lifts all the dirt and things like that. <clears throat> I really like this video, it's, it's really cool. Um, okay. <clears throat> But basically, yes, to, to test materials, it seems there is no need for such huge explosions. It's enough to channel the energy in a tube, and this will give a quite uniform pressure. So yes, this absorbing nature of the material is good. It can absorb shocks. Um, and I guess depending on the thickness of the phase sheet, there will be different momentum transfer. Uh, because yes, there are two conservation laws, the momentum and the energy conservation. So with the thicker one, yes, the momentum means there is slower movement because there is higher mass. Um, but yes, it is a quite crashable material. I try to model it with my colleagues in Poland, in Poznań, at Poznań Technical University using Abacus, just to see what would happen with those spheres and for the thin one, yes, we compress the foam and the spheres get exposed. For the thick one, there is more momentum. But I guess the interesting thing for me was also the, the waves. If you look at the waves, yes, it seems that there are some kind of, maybe we can guide those waves. And again, I feel this might be an interesting field of research. I mean, there are more important topics, right? Like climate change and uh, net emissions. And so this is maybe not the most important topic, but what I find interesting about this is that basically the medium is evolving, right? So if you had like elastic wave propagation, your medium is what it is and you look at the waves, but here the medium is evolving, right? So as the wave propagates, the densities are changing, the stiffness is changing. So basically, if you want, yes, the numerical solution can be achieved if those parameters are updated to get like an analytical solution for this evolving material might be quite challenging. But I think this is maybe the challenge of this kind of waveguides for military applications, because I know that there are acoustic waveguides or optical when we can create like invisibility cloaks. And I think to do this for protective systems, someone needs to grapple with this nonlinearity, that this will evolve and whatever objective you want to achieve, this cannot be, yes, it has to be like an iterative process, I guess. <clears throat> but I think it might be possible to guide those waves. So maybe they don't transmit or, but I guess there are some hard laws like conservation of momentum and energy, especially momentum. So. It has to go, force has to go somewhere, <clears throat> but maybe we can channel it to some hard locations or, <clears throat> or maybe some dissipative locations. <clears throat> yes, and these are the waves in between. It is interesting, but yes, I don't have any funding to sort of explore it or, yes. I guess what I wanted to mention at the end, if there is still a few more minutes, is that I am really interested in developing links and co cooperations, and we have been working on this with Luis as well, on like stochastic material models, because nothing is ideal in the real life. Like how do we model the variability of materials in space using stochastic fields? How do we characterize it? And especially those cellular materials, they always fail in a different way. We have been all also working on this um, image-based characterization of materials for the stochastic features, but also for stress fields. Like how can we advance and um, those tools, we have been developing this open source tool for like post-processing of images 
to get more information about variation and stress fields. And yes, maybe if you have some use cases or if you work with such materials, that would be really interesting to kind of to reach out and discuss this and think of inverse of solution to this inverse problem. I just wanted to interject it at the end, yes, that that it's nice to talk about those applications, but it's all underpinned with some toolkits, methods, mechanics, and they are also very interesting. Um, and yes, there is always way to develop more understanding, yes, in fracture, in stochastics, in characterization. Okay, so in the summary, it seems that energy of vibrations can be channeled to strengthen the hierarchical material to destroy the cutting tool. This is the paradox that the energy comes from the battery of the tool because the vibrations are in the disk from the rotation and those vibrations create interfacial movement that is killing it at the end. But there is no <clears throat> energy needed. It comes from the cutting tool. <clears throat> Extreme loads can in introduce sort of interval waves um so internal waves yes so this blast responses i find this is also quite interesting this maybe yes in the acoustic con context vibrational also no linear one um yes and the, the waves sometimes can fragment those bullets so maybe we don't need hard ceramics as much maybe we just need to be more clever about how these waves work and some of those waves maybe could be reflected to destroy the bullets using its own energy, just like we use the vibrations to destroy the angle grinder. Um, and maybe that could enable like a lightweight, very lightweight effective armor in the future. Um, yes, and uh, development of applied mechanics, I feel this really underpins all those developments because we can be inspired by nature, but at the end to design things, we need good computational tools, good characterization. Like, uh, so it works in the real life. And this is impossible without good applied mechanics toolkit um, and methods and, and tools, even the simulations in LSDyne as they are basically as based on the work of many research groups and techniques. And I guess thinking about the future outlook, I'm really excited about this concept of pre-programmable and metamorphic materials. And I think that there are two groups. One is in soft robotics, like trying to develop kind of soft grippers or things that behave like flowers that uh, trap uh, insects. <clears throat> and there are also other groups that work on this bistable materials that when you load it, it can snap through to different shapes and maybe this can be tuned somehow. But I feel that this is a huge space because yes, materials respond to heat. So they can have different thermal expansion coefficients. So that means they could maybe have different shapes at different temperatures. Um, there is shape memory effect. There is stability, be stability. There are some chemical effects like covalent bonds for soft materials. So it seems that there are many toolkits to create something kind of quasi interactive that could do some yes, responsive behavior um, to the loads. Okay, thank you for your attention. Uh, this is this kind of like an animation that shows the, the, the samples after partial cuts to kind of summarize my talk. It was created by Florian Bittner in, in Hanover at the Hanover Institute. So, yes, it kind of showcases the, the cellular structure of metals and ceramics. Yes, the red is the powder, kind of, and the greens are the cracks in the foam because it's susceptible to tensile fracture. Yes, we have a patent pending, but I don't think it's that useful. Uh, but yes, it's still worth mentioning, I guess, in the talk some kind of disclosure yes that <coughs> that was when i used to work at the university of sari that 
yes, we don't transfer any kind of IP by presenting this. But yes, thank you very much. And I'm really curious about your questions. Luis, I think you are muted. I always do this myself Sorry. too, yes. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Stefan. As always, oh, wonderful and inspiring talk. Uh, so now I'll open for questions and um, please, if you have a question, I would encourage you to, you to use the button reaction and then put your hands up. Uh, that's one way, or you can just unmute and, and talk. Or you can also write in the chat. Uh, well, first of all, let me start with Professor Labac. Uh, Luis, how many questions can I ask? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I think as many as you want because yes, it's I, I already have at least five fifty. So yes. <laughs> I have like I have like thirty questions. I'll try to <laughs> summarize in two questions. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for your talk. It's very inspiring. All these problems that relate to, you know, trying to model nature are, you know, we learn so much in the process and essentially we learn that we know very little about. Yes, it's, I agree with you. <laughs> it's a very interesting process. Uh, but the questions I have, I'll try to focus on two questions. The first one is that uh, the problem, the non cutable material is a very counterintuitive problem because you're using vibration yes. and the interaction with vibration from the inclusions and the tool itself to make the material not cuttable. So I was just wondering that this interaction between inclusions and the vibration modes of the tool, if this can be tuned for specific tools or for, for a wide range of tools, like if you change the shape of the inclusions or their vibration modes or their distribution so that they can affect different tools differently, um, especially in the case of the, the blast that you showed in the last, the last part that you can, you said maybe you can find, you can define um, uh, waveguides to, you know, divert energy to somewhere, maybe you can change those inclusions with some kind of topology optimization, that kind of problem. So the question is more like if you can fine tune the interaction between the tool and the, the material. And the other question is more like a uh, more high level question. Uh, you talk a lot about discovery, that you were studying this material and all of a sudden you discovered some kind of property. So I was wondering how you came up with this material in the first place, if it was some kind of simulation that you were doing and you realized that this could be done or you were working on some kind of other problem and then you figured that this could be used for this purpose. Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. These are very good questions. Uh, yes, so basically tuning is possible with, uh, yes, uh, by changing the mass, the diameter, and we actually looked into this a little bit. <clears throat> so uh, hard inclusions in soft material are uh, oftentimes called local resonators, and you can use them uh, to create stress band gaps. So there were papers, for example, if you place like a very heavy um, steel cylinder, like a big chunk of metal that is maybe the size of the desk, and you suspend it in a soft slurry, like a gel, and if you build like a pile wall or a grid, apparently it could affect the seismic waves. So this could take out some frequencies from the seismic waves and they would go in the local resonation of those masses. And that could protect maybe a structure if it's sensitive to this frequency. So these local resonators, they have been used in acoustic materials um, quite commonly, and they can be tuned. Yes, yeah, so we can increase, reduce the size. We try to be quite close with the natural frequency of those to the frequencies in the disk. So like being the same order of magnitude uh, so they can interact. The good news is that the disc have many modes. Like it's not only one mode, they have all kinds of modes. So even if you miss one, there is next one not far from you. And uh, so that's good news that they are quite multimodal. Um, and also when we place a point load, it is kind of also adding this transient behavior as well, because it's like an obstacle, like it's this impact 
yes, when you hit something with a hammer, you will always excite natural modes. So it's kind of like a bifunctional, but so we did only like approximate tuning, nothing specific to more to simulate it. It's almost impossible to simulate this interaction at the interface and, you know, fracture of spheres and abrasion. And so the, to, to, to ask, to, to basically answer your question about the discovery. So I would say, I think it's a combination of curiosity and luck because I have tried 20 other things that failed. I think I placed like hollow spheres in concrete because I wanted to check for damping or I, you know, there's so many things that didn't work um, or some analytical solutions or that. So, but yes, we never talk about those failures. And uh, so in this case, there was this idea that this pattern seems to be common in nature. Uh, foam, cellular material is not going to stop the cutting disc. But yes, if we create a contrast, maybe then it's a bit like this uh, Abalon seashell. But then of course there was this reflection that cutting tool is not like an impact or predator that is trying to eat this sea creature and crack it open, but it's more like a moving tool. So there is movement, not like a huge hammer that is trying to smash it. So then there was this realization that uh, actually Yes, hardness could be one way, uh, but maybe vibrations is another avenue we could explore. Um, so I would say it was, yes, thinking what we can do with what we have, because there were many different groups that tried to address this challenge. For example, a group from Oxford or Cambridge, they had idea of like having cylinders that are like uh, rolling, like um, uh, bearings that if you try to cut it, it will just rotate in the opposite direction. Sometimes you see, I saw an Italian lock maker, they have like a circular plate that can rotate. So if you try to drill uh, through the lock, you cannot do this because this cover plate is rotating with the drill. It's not resisting it. And it's, uh, yeah, the drill doesn't have like a bearing to, to grind it, but it didn't work because you just push with the angle grinder on this, you know, cylinder and the friction uh, is already enough to lock it enough for the grinder to get a grip and start cutting through it. Um, so I guess the intuition was what we can do with what we have and, and let's see what happens. And then some things manifest themselves like this uh, granular fragmentation that was pure lack that we had low quality ceramics. And then you think about this and you say, oh, it makes sense. It's like a sandbag in the war zone, you know, uh, a lot of discussions as well. I would say maybe discussions are the most important because I presented some early results to colleagues in other places and they would say, oh, yes, this is a strainer effect. Maybe, you know, or this is this. So then these discussions add more light, more kind of information, and this becomes a bit, you know, clearer. Um, I don't know if it makes sense. Does it make sense? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so long story short, I was in the right place at the right time and I was looking for it, I guess. Maybe that's the only difference. So um, would you like to ask next next question, please? So, um, uh, Stefana, I will, since nobody's asking, I, I will ask a couple of questions. So, um, <coughs> the first one is, um, actually yesterday, uh, I was getting ready for the next day, and I uh, was thinking what I was going to do, and I was listening to a podcast, and it was a mathematician uh, from, uh, from Cambridge, and he was talking about uh, uh, sharks and their skin. Mm -hmm. And then I remember that you had a project with uh, James Guest from Hopkins, right? and and I remember that you made you made some comment about uh, uh, about shark skin and how they work. So first of all, like, could you could you give you could you give us a little bit more information on what is that and what you saw in sharks that uh, that sparked your imagination? And and I'll add with a comment that you said, oh, I. 
think that I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, I agree, like luck is very important, but also you you were prepared to see that. Uh, again, like what Ben Schaefer told me like uh, many years ago, it was like, if you can harness the creative creativity of the fun, you can get lots of good things out of him. And, and I think you just, you found, uh, you harnessed that. So, but please uh, tell us a little bit more about the project with uh, James Guest, if you if you are alone. Yes, yes, yes. No, that's fine. I think that was a different project on lattices, on basically like a three D woven metallic lattice, and uh, yes, and uh, looking at the aerodynamic effect. So the idea was that yes, creating like a porous interface could change the flow. And I guess to answer your question about the shark skin, it seems that sharks have quite intricate, intricate um, texture. And it's not entirely clear why. Like one option is maybe it's like golf balls, but maybe another option is that maybe uh, those structures, they produce uh, air bubbles. So it's a bit, you know, like those fast missiles, they produce like a, like a, uh, submarine, you know, uh, what are they called? Torpedoes. Oftentimes they have this cavitation, so they travel like in the air bubble, and maybe sharks produce like micro air bubbles that they can create those, you know, micro uh, bubbles that reduce the friction. Uh, maybe also through 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 turbulence, uh, but I'm just looking for the for the yes for the um, shark skin image it has a quite interesting uh interesting sort of structure maybe i'll try to find it but the idea there was that maybe we cannot really manufacture it it's not practical uh, like to 3d print such fine structure so can we do something like this like using wires or 3d printers or maybe 3d weaving to also produce like a platform that we have ability to tune, to change some features. And uh, what happens if we uh, use it on a cylinder? Because cylinder is a well-known bluff body. Uh, there's a lot of data and we know we didn't want to use a complicated shape for this. So the observations were quite interesting is that the flow can come in. We have this, if it's in the lee side, so there is a little bit of suction. So usually the base has negative pressure suction. Here there is positive pressure when the flow is hitting it. And maybe we can kind of curve the streamlines and delay the flow separation there by yes, connecting these two regions. And I guess for the flow facing region, uh, there is inflow into the porous material and then outflow. So this might create like micro jets here. And it's a bit similar to like a tripwire. Um, so this will trigger a turbulence. But basically it seems that maybe we can create some interactions at the boundary layer by changing this uh, structure that is more crude. And I guess our observation was that maybe this could be useful for automotive. This is a bit speculative that basically we could have some edges that are made of porous materials and they do different things under different low flow conditions. So when it's like flow facing, this is like triggering turbulence and uh, mixing the flow. And this is like curving the flow and uh, taking advantage of the suction uh, in the back of the track to uh, curve the streamlines downwards. But if there is a cross flow, maybe they work in this way that now this is like, triggering the turbulence maybe and these parts are kind of pulling it. So this idea of multifunctionality that maybe with one structure it can work under different conditions and maybe we can think how to tweak it. But yes, if this was successful, we could say that we tried to take some microstructures from sharks or and then apply it to tracks in some target locations to change the flow in a good way, reduce the resistance but using something that is more bespoke. Um, and I guess one thing that I learned on this project was that it's very complicated. The aerodynamics is very unpredictable, like it's very hard to test things, very hard to understand. Um, but yes, that was the motivation. And um, if I look in my publication record for shark skin, 
maybe I will show you what the shark skin looks like, but I know that there was an issue with the swimmers suits, right? That um, that they were banned because the, this pattern was like replicated uh, and then the, the records were improved. Um, I think it might be here, shark. Yes, shark skin for fluid and the skin pattern. So this is, yes, an example of what it looks like, that different type of, oh, I see. And I think the interesting feature with uh, observation with this is that if you look at this, this region, the, <clears throat> the sort of fin uh, of different sharks, they don't look the same. And if you look at that region, you know, it depends on, you know, Mako will have slightly different pattern than like smooth hammerhead. So it seems that this needs to be tuned for a specific shape. If you have a different type of shark or shape, you will end up with different type of textures. So I think we oftentimes hope that there is like a golden, you know, surface pattern and you, pa you, pa you place it on all kinds of vehicles and it always works, but it turns out that nature tells us, no, everything has to be bespoke. So if you change the vehicle, you should have different pattern. And maybe this pattern also varies from location to location. So it's not the same here, it's not the same there. So the, this idea of copy paste is not going to work that we have one unit cell, but this needs to be designed for. So I think that was the challenge of the project that we are trying to do. We have all those freedoms with the wires and structures, but how do we come up with the best pattern that would maximize the benefit even for a cylinder. We tried like two or three patterns, uh, but they are, you know, the same everywhere. If we try to have a variable one, we would need a super powerful supercomputer to basically say we have all those degrees of freedom and we are trying to find a combination that gives us the best aerodynamic performance. So we end up with kind of, you know, pattern that is made of wires, but it's also bespoke in different locations and triggers different phenomena. The problem with that was that it turns out we cannot even model it computationally. Like when we looked at simplified modeling techniques that use uh, homogenization for porous flow and some uh, interface uh, connection between the external flow and porous flow, they simply give incorrect results. So those methods, you know, they tell you one thing, but when you test, you, have, you measure something different. So the surface roughness and those little features are important. If you try to model the little features and the big um, specimen, the mesh is just humongous because you need to cover the length scales from microns to meters and uh, all kinds of length scales of eddies from micro to macro. So I was told that this might be possible on a supercomputer that has many CPUs, maybe hundreds. And uh, this would be needed to just check one uh, design scenario, right? But if we have one million variables, we probably need to check one million scenarios to find the best configuration, right? So this was kind of overwhelming that this problem could be solved, but it seems it needs like super computing and then the space is so huge. So I guess nature had millions of years to find it. But I think this is kind of a challenge that, you know, how do we overcome this computational barrier and how do we, Yes, I think it needs to be some clever way of homogenization maybe, but he clearly here, this modeling technique doesn't work. Maybe some kind of machine learning or hybrid automata that the machine learning can search the design space, like it can feel where to go. We don't have to use gradient to tell us, you know, go there, but it kind of can recognize that there is some pattern um, and find the right location faster. Um, but yes, yeah, so basically this computational work was not successful and I was trying to submit proposals for computational work, but yes, I ha don't have enough track record in fluid dynamics, so that was not successful so far. Um, and yes, we have this experimental results which show the promise that something is possible. 
But yes, it is a bumpy road because initially that was of interest in nature. They said, oh, submit a full paper, looks interesting. But when we submit the full paper, they say, oh, not so interesting anymore. <laughs> you know, it doesn't look that good, <laughs> you know, go somewhere else. Uh, and when we go somewhere else and, you know, you get some reviewers who basically will tell you, oh, this is uh, not novel at all because similar work was done by Professor Bodoruk on foams. But it turns out that Professor Bodoruk was the examiner of this PhD thesis. I invited him from, um, he has, he retired two years ago. Uh, but basically yes, it's Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And I invited him and he was happy to come and examine the student and we had dinner and he said, yes, this is interesting work. It's pushing the knowledge, you know, he was happy. And then I have a reviewer in a journal who tells me this work is not sufficiently novel over work of Professor Bodoruk, you know, <laughs> because he knows better than Professor Ruk <laughs> by, you know, looking at his papers. He has better expertise. <clears throat> but yes, this is a long discussion, I guess, right? It, this yeah, is the, well, the, the, one thing that I've learned also with biomimicking, like, uh, you know, I have a paper on that too. Uh, it's uh, when you look at nature, sometimes nature gets stuck in a local minimum, like you, mm -hmm. nature is trying to optimize a problem and nature got, gets stuck in a local minimum. And it's very hard for us to actually know if it's a local minimum or a global minimum, right? We, yes. we are as an engineer, we are like, oh, I want to find the global minimum. And, and, and that, that is not always, not always the case. And it's, uh, it's very challenging, like in that, in that sense. Oh, totally. I agree with you. Yes. Maybe that's why we have so many species of uh, sharks or animals, right? Because mm -hmm. if there was one global minimum, then everyone would be this global, you know, perfect uh, living organism. Yeah. But we have such a great variety because maybe there are so many local minima and some evolutionary mm -hmm. things get stuck there. Yeah. Uh, and yes, maybe we are beneficiaries of this local minima <laughs> that we exist. Exactly. Uh, but yes, I agree with you. I don't know how to discriminate. I think these are the images of those, you know, shark skin. I think they don't look really like shark skin to me. It's just some kind of pattern, mm -hmm. but it was good enough to create this air packets. Yes. But mm -hmm. I honestly, I feel this is a very interesting, uh, you know, I feel this field of trying to create computational evolution using human-made materials to create something complex is a great field. Mm -hmm. It's just that this brute force is, yes, how is it going to work with brute force with so many variables and... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so is there any other question? Our question time is almost over. Um, Professor Bittencourt, please. So, hi, Stefan. Thank you very much for your very nice talk. Talking and uh, so uh, my question was, yes, related to this, to this slide there. So my question, I believe you have answer to Luis, but uh, how, how, how do you model these uh, let's see structures? Uh, it, it do have a kind of harmonization in terms of the material model, or do you need to model in detail all the aspects of the, the cellular structure? Yes, thank you for this question. Uh, so, his, traditionally, I would just model this in detail. Uh, so this is like LS Dyna simulation, and I would go for the complexity of it. And the same is here, yes, with contact. So there is no kind of breakthrough in modeling. More recently, I started looking into homogenization techniques, um, but uh, I reached out to mathematicians. Uh, for example, Daniel Colquitt in Liverpool, his specialty is homogenization uh, and especially dynamic homogenization. And from what I understand is they basically take advantage of different length scales. Uh, these methods are called asymptotic methods that those different length scales maybe don't interact or are not significant one to another. Um, but no, this is not my expertise. Like, um, I feel that homogenization is yes, the static one is already quite maybe yes, established, but if once we go to the dynamics and maybe also when we add waves to this, um, 
it is possible, but yes, there are some new elements. And if the contact gets in, but I agree with you, I feel this would be a great direction, yes, because if we can homogenize it, then we can solve big problems at much faster speed. So for the waves, it's definitely a way to go. I don't know how can this be done for uh, fluid dynamics because there are so many different like eddies, length scales like those lattices. There are micro cylinders and then they generate lattices or yes, if you think of this lattice there, it's like a cylinder, so it will have a wake, but now we have thousands of micro cylinders and they are on top of the big cylinder, right? So which has its big wake. So maybe that's an advantage that we have different length scales. Maybe those asymptotic methods could be used. But I agree with you, this might be really the way to go. I guess the other way I was told about is something called hybrid automata. It is used in machine learning uh, to control autonomous cars. Uh, so they don't crash into each other. And apparently it's like a hybrid method that combines, um, I don't know if I can find it, but it combines differential equations with machine learning. Like it basically has those, uh, maybe Bogo, yes, linear systems. So basically it like, there is a little bit of logic and like computing, but there are also ordinary differential equations that, there. So some of those boxes are ordinary differential equations. And this is already kind of like advanced by, yes, automotive industry to make decisions, merge, like incorporate physics in the machine learning. And I wonder if this could be advanced more I mean, Sergey was telling me that he believes that all partial differential equations can be converted into ordinary ones, that that's the point of homogenization from like mathematicians point of view, some kind of like recasting of differential equations. So I think if this can be done for complex problems and maybe then linked with machine learning algorithms, this hybrid automata, maybe this can tell us where to go. So that would be like the other direction, but I agree with you as we are not computer scientists, so we will not advance probably machine learning, but we can advance homogenization. And I think this can be more than just speed of calculations. Maybe this can interface with machine learning more efficiently in that form. But there's already some framework there. I'm trying to learn it, but I don't have honestly time to understand. And the other problem is that it's not easy to establish cooperations with machine learning experts because they are in high demand. They have so many projects they could do for big data, for automotive. So to get them interested in engineering is not easy. That's the, what I have discovered recently. So Stefan, well, thank you very much. Again, like it's 6.20 for you. I know that you, your family is waiting. Uh, Labak, you wanna ask another question? Sorry. That's fine. Uh, but I, yeah, we really appreciated your your time and also your presentation. As always, very interesting, very inspiring. Uh, 